uh, we have it recorded and then uh, I'll let Mary and Warren decide if we put it on YouTube or how we use it. Um, so I am going to go ahead and mute everyone. Um, okay, so I just muted everyone who's in the meeting. Um, and what we're going to do is Mary is going to talk first. Mary, I just asked you to unmute. So if you would unmute yourself. Um, Mary is going to talk first. And then um, Warren's going to talk after Mary. If you'd like to ask questions while someone's talking, please put them in the chat and I can read them for you. Please don't turn your mics off just because it gets really loud when there's so many people here. Um, and as another note, I will just say that uh, Mary and Warren's show is up through March 5th. If you can't make it during our listed gallery hours, you can just email me and we can find another time for you to come. If you'd like to come for a private visit, we can organize that. Um, and it's really no imposition at all. Don't feel shy about doing that. I'm gonna be at the club on uh, this Sunday opening the gallery for like one visitor. So I really, I'm very happy to do it. It's no imposition at all. Um, and so I will let Mary take it away from here. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen where I put together a PowerPoint and um, so I won't see you as well, but I'll be able to show this um, Providence Art Club. And as I was saying earlier, the first, the first thing that struck me when preparing this presentation was how much it had meant to me to be um, a student, an artist, and a member of the art club and the, all the support from the staff um, even to um, people who are no longer with us, like Craig's wife, Gail, who was my drawing teacher for years and years. Um, and also for how much help Michael, Abba and Bree were in getting the show together and um, making it professional. And um, I just, there were a million questions. So, so thank you. Thank you from a very grateful artist. Um, the first, section of my show was imagined gardens. Um, in As part of lockdown, you know, I love to travel and paint wherever I can. And as part of lockdown, I started imagining, um, looking for ways to look in instead of out. As a plein air painter, I always looked out, but I started developing gardens for some of the people in my family. This, this is a garden for um, my grandmother, Dorsey. Now, both of her sons, my, my father and uncle are on the Zoom talk. Um, she was an artist and very encouraging of her grandchildren and their art. And she loved Japan, though she never got there. So um, I had a lot of fun making a space and a garden for her memory, um, enjoying the children and the landscape in Japan. There's a little Japanese shrine. And, you know, as an architect, this is a totally imagined space. It, it has a slightly different quality than some of my other paintings because it doesn't exist anywhere. Um, I, I put the pieces together um, from shrines in Kyoto to river banks and distant towns and, and the Koinobori flags. Um, and it's a very different and wonderful exercise. Um, this, this was called a garden for a young couple and it's loosely modeled on all different elements from Blythewald over in Bristol. Um, when Rob and I were young, we did a picnic or two over where we sat under this tree and sort of went through imagining this as, we pretended that this was our estate and just hung out and had a wonderful time and you know, looking at the vista. And now, you know, going back, I can see ourselves at all different times and I had fun filling it with plants and, the memory of walking through a landscape a lot over time. Um, so that was a garden for a young couple. This, all of these larger paintings for me had studies done um, 
Here, I, I flipped the elements, but looking at the colors and the shapes and textures and seeing if it had legs as a picture before we did a bigger version of it. Um, and this is a garden for a young family. This was my childhood house when we were growing up. Um, brothers and sisters, uh, a sort of oversized Japanese maple tree, um, and even brought in, um, this is my mom's mom who passed away before my mom grew up. And I put her in as a little bit of a guardian spirit. So just the joy and excitement and energy of a young family um, was, was in this picture. Um, the next set of pictures were from a trip to um, Glencoe, Scotland. And I loved it so much that I put this, this image on. Glencoe's in sort of mid-level Scotland up in the areas where there are um, glacial fjords and rivers and all kinds of geology going on. And there's this wonderful valley that leads up from Loch Levin um, with beautiful big peaks and just lush countryside. And the um, weather, we were there in the fall, the weather moved across it in pulses of rain and sunlight, um, a lot of mist in the air and um, shafts of light and dramatic dark shadows on the rocks. Um, and I've been working on how how to put paint up to best express the visual sense of um, the hills and the drama of the landscape. Um, had a lot of fun doing these, um, all anxious to go back. This, this was another one of a cloud, cloud shadow and hill and sunlight and um, looking at how to get paint on the canvas to make that, um, get that impression across. The hills looked so soft when you looked up at them. And if you try to walk up in this, it's a mixture of gorse and rock and mud pits. And, um, but as you look up at it, there's this just beautiful sweep with the sunlight sweeping across and then shadows again um, and the streams traveling the landscape. It, it was um, probably cleared out at some point by the English. I, there's all kinds of rough history. It wasn't an easily taken care of place, but the light and the sky and the shapes of the land were just um, all the different light conditions. Like this was early in the morning as the sun just started hitting the hills um, and reflecting in the stream. Um, and the layering of the landscape, um, just just a, a lot of a lot of pleasure in there. So um, Scotland was a, a big muse for me, and um, I think that's the end of Scotland. Yep, I have a couple in here from um, Zion National Park. Again, another landscape that. Um, just got me very excited. This this is on the east side of the park, less um, frequented, um, and we you could get out and walk around in these. The sweep of this landscape was just such a visual pleasure. And if you ever get a chance to go in the fall, the the bright poplar leaves or cottonwood or the different trees turning color um, with the, this, this is the opposite of Scotland because the air is so clear. Um, there's not a drop of moisture anywhere. And um, I had a lot of fun using the paint colors to, to get the effects of the light. The hills themselves are just painted with all different layers and then trying to get them in the, the sweep was kept me on my toes. And then through it all, the um, Virgin River 
ran and was sculpting these spires. So the formations were really fantastical and looking, looking for ways to get the paint to um, describe the light and the movement and to move your eye around. Um, and then the reflection of the leaves in the stream uh, make it a really great experience. Um, I told Michael I'd move right along and I'm living up to my promise. So <laughs> I can field questions too. Um, the last section is some paintings from New England. Um, I'll try to say where they're from. I think the thing that's attracted me to landscape painting is it's, it's a way to participate in the landscape. Um, when you get there and you wanna be there for a while, knowing what you do, you, you know, how you can eat, you can walk around, you can pile up stones on each other, or you can, you can paint. Um, and uh, so as I was looking at these trees, I noticed how much they looked like they were in a slow dance with each other, a dance that had lasted longer than I'd been alive. You, you know, they, I love um, gesture and these trees just, you could see them saying a story, but it was a really long, interesting story. They were paying attention to each other for a long time. This is down in Goddard State Park in Rhode Island and um, beautiful collection of trees there. Um, this is looking at some really overscaled sunflower down in Little Compton. And um, I put myself in it just, just, just for fun um, because I like the scale of a person against the flowers and again, the gesture and exuberance of the flowers. Um, really uh, caught my attention. Also the shadow, um, a lot of times the shadows are a really fun part of landscape painting for me. When you're trying to get the effect of the light as it's changing at the end of the day or the trees are backlit, um, it really uh, adds a lot of life to the painting. Um, this was up in Vermont um, on a summer morning I'm trying to get out early. And uh, again, I love trees. A lot of my paintings have trees in them. And I've been trying to learn how to express the character and the um, interest of each individual tree. So not as, a, not as a symbol of a tree, but looking at actually what the tree is. Um, these are a couple from up in Maine. Um, again, hiking around looking for a composition. And both of these were on foggy days. A few places I showed up in at Maine, um, I could see that there was a scene there I wanted to paint, but there was so much fog that it was impossible to actually paint anything. These, these New England paintings are uh, plein air paintings with some studio work afterwards. So um, I, don't, I don't do it all in one go. I tend to see more when I come back. Out in the field, the weather's changing. Uh, the bus pulls in, the boat pulls out, the um, tide changes. Um, so I'd love to be able to come back to the studio and just um, give them have one more go by. Um, and this is the final slide of um, seeing sun through the trees as it's rising up in Vermont. Or again, beautiful tree on the, this was a big coastal swamp plain, floodplain. And then there were a few rock outcroppings that were in the middle of this long plain with these 
really individual and beautiful trees. So um, that that's there's there are more paintings in the catalog. They're um, fun to see in person if you have a chance um, because the photography, well, fabulous is it's hard to catch the exact painting. Um, but I I appreciate your attention. Um, I've been really excited to do the show and um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mary. Um, I think I'll ask at least one question to start with. And then again, if anyone has any questions, just put them in the chat and I'll be happy to read them for you. Um, you talked a little bit about working plein air and then going into the studio. For the paintings that you did in Scotland, what was your process for those? Did you do watercolors while you were there or did you bring back photos? I did watercolors and some sketches and then brought back photos to work from them. Someday I'm going to just buy paints in Scotland and leave them there. If you can't fly with them, I'm just going to load up and buy the paints and donate them to a worthy artist because um, it's so hard to get the light right. Um, photos are great, but being there is, is a joy. It's a great struggle. I think I think that's the most fun thing for me is even though it's hard, it's it's such a pleasure to try. Um, I think a lot of people play golf that way. They don't always play a great game, but it's really fun to try going for it. You don't have a winner every day at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you find to be the most challenging? Um, is it the atmosphere that's most challenging? Like for you as an architect, you must not have as much trouble with like building up forms, right? It's probably more about color and stuff like that. Well, when you when you're on site, you're you're looking for the picture, and I found it was. You know, as a younger painter, I thought there was not much to paint around my house. And um, during COVID, I had to really look at it again. It's, it's composing the picture in your mind and pulling out the stuff that doesn't need to be there. Um, like Dora taught me about putting the, structure, the value structure in first, just the darks and lights to make sure you've got, if you've got the values right, you've got a strong painting. If you don't have the values right, you can work and work and work at that painting, but you're, it's an uphill struggle. So, but I think it's, you're, there's so much when you're there, you've got the excitement of the scene and your vision and it's a stretch and you've got your drawing and your values and your comp, you know, it's, you really got to go for it. And sometimes, you know, it's, I have a, boxes of paintings that it didn't work for, but <laughs> they keep moving along, I keep learning, um, and it keeps being somewhere between exciting, terrifying, and a lot of fun. So, <laughs> do, do you find that doing like a, like a sketch in advance is a good way to figure out your composition, to use like a viewfinder or anything like that, or how do you come about your composition? A, a lot, I'll do a viewfinder. As a young painter, I kept trying to stuff horizontal things and I'd end up with odd paintings. So the viewfinder helped me to get, uh, and I like painting on a longer canvas to get to get the, the sweep of your eye. Um, but sometimes I draw or do a quick, um, just a little value two inch sketch, but a lot I work on the value study Ella Prima, you know, with a thinned out mixture of black and white, just to get the value structure right. You know, if um, that's, I just find that I'm not satisfied with my pictures when I don't get the values right. So that's my current <laughs> investigation. And then when you move on to the, when you move on to the canvas, do you ever draw on the canvas or do you, are you like painting right away? You're always you're painting. painting, right? I'm, you know, <laughs> I start the oil, oil painting, which is the only medium I do is very sculptural. Um, and I don't want to, I'm not filling in lines. I'm, I'm creating the form um, and the shape and the composition of the picture. And the oil paint lets me 
you know, rub it out, move it over. Um, so I'm, I'm working while I block it out. And how has now, now you have a studio at the art club, which is kind of a recent thing for you. What's that like having a studio in the Flair de Lee building? It's my COVID consolation. I, <laughs> I love it. I, I can't get enough of it. And I, and I even haven't had the social aspect. You know, Anthony and I are in that building. I'm on the third floor. He's on the first floor. And there are days when I don't see anybody at the art club. So I'm looking forward to lunches and classes. And, but the studio has just, it's just, I've never had one before. This has been my studio in, in a small space. And I, lo I just love it. I just. Cool, I'm glad. Um, we do have a question in the chat from Sarah Craig who asked, um, she said, it, it sounds like you've been painting for many years. Are you spending more time painting these days? And what is the earliest painting in this exhibition? Oh, they're, they're all from about the last year and a half. Um, one of the earlier ones that I didn't show is the picture of Rob and myself at the garage. But um, the Scott and the, the um, Zion pictures are a little earlier. Um, I painted for a while before I joined the art club. And I really don't feel like I grew as an artist until I was doing the classes there. Um, I was making the same mistakes and going around. I, I didn't know what I didn't know. So the art club really helped me move ahead. Um, but I've been doing it for a long time, a little obsessively. I'm mm -hmm. in the process of slowly retiring as an architect so that I can um, put more focused energy in on it. Um, and maybe someday travel again, who knows? <laughs> yeah, not on Zoom. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Mary that you'd like to put in the chat? I'm happy to ask them for you. Or if not, then we can, um, I have slides for Warren. So what we'll do next is, um, Thank you again, Mary, for your part of the presentation. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you. If thank you have you. a question for Mary that like, you know, that watching um, Warren talk about his work, if that triggers a question in you, just put it in the chat and we can do questions for both Mary and Warren at the very end of the, um, at the very end of the program. So, um, so I just asked you to unmute Warren and I will, let me just open your slides on my computer. Um, let's see. Well, thank you. That was that was uh, uh, enjoyable, Mary. And uh, and now, as they say, I think uh, some great comedy troupe said, "Now for something completely different." <laughs> we'll be looking at um, some hard-edged paintings. Yes, um, this is the earliest painting in the show. Um, it's something I did. And um, in about two and a half years ago, a couple of years ago, and it finally I'd been trying to paint urban scenes and I finally came up with something that was simple enough and strong enough that um, I showed it to somebody and they said, for a minute there, I didn't know what I was looking at. And then I knew that I was onto something because I, I wanted to try to always be a little bit on the border of abstraction and recognizable things, though I've come to realize that our eyes and brains are so attuned to understanding space that it's really hard not to make out that it's a building and something under a building and that. But uh, but this is the kind of stuff I've, I've I like to paint and what is almost dominates my show. Uh, parts of the city that are kind of maybe overlooked, mundane, uh, compositions that as photographs, they'd almost look like snapshots and be rather boring and forgettable. But I think, uh, as Mary said, um, you know, there's paint. It is a absolutely, you know, breathtaking medium, really, even I still think of that and uh, you smear it on something, you hone it, you tool it, you brush it and it uh, 
you try to come up with something. So you can go to the next slide. Uh, this is more, uh, you know, about a about last late last year. Um, I really just, you know, would I, I do almost all my paintings, at least paintings here, all done from photos. But I spend a, I mean, my career has been in architectural photography, and as I said in my artist statement in the show, I mean, I spent decades, you know, photographing really beautiful things and trying to make them look very ideal and flawless. And, you know, I am proud of my compositions, but it, I realized with painting, you're so much freer. And, and what, again, what appealed to me was taking these very, very kind of bald and um, sometimes coarse areas and finding beauty in them. And here, the, uh, the lines of the crosswalk really appealed to me in contrast to the tilt of the telephone pole, the utility lines, and then that, that almost humorous little R2D2 of a mailbox tilted, you know, not straight up, and its color echoing the, the shadowed side of the building across the street. Uh, and then asphalt, I just think uh, an underappreciated <laughs> part uh, of, often uh, the bane of many of our lives, but still uh, there's beauty there and painting uh, that that's been appealing to me. You can go to the next one, Michael. Sure. Um, this is in the square format, which I think you know a lot of people find both challenging and rewarding, or rewarding. Um, I was I was drawn to this scene again. It's a kind of a happenstance place, but it's all this sort of. Uh, you know, mixture and layering of these polygons and nothing is quite straight up and down while there are some, some verticals. Um, but then there's the, the textures, the colors, and, and uh, you know, a Jersey barrier. I mean, you know, I always look at those and think, oh, but yet, you know, they're, they, they make such, they can make beautiful shapes. And, uh, and I really always, started to love the the you know yellow lines on pavement and how they add that sort of spark to a painting and then of course this vivid colored parking little hut with a odd looking little round vent and you know all these quirky things that i guess appeal to me and i think some of the best painting i've done to date is in that fire escape in the back where it's just loose almost difficult to figure out, but you know it's a built structure. There's a lots of darks there, but there's interest in them. And um, I don't know, I, I really I like this painting. So next one. Uh, this ended up in a little larger size and um, you know, a, a, you know, a lot of painters obviously would, you know, in search out the en either end of a day. And this is very, very late in the afternoon in the uh, um, early spring, uh, leaf still leafless trees in the distance. But again, I don't know, the asphalt here was just so appealing and these long, long shadows and how, you know, between a combination of a of sort of lightly applied paint, rubbed out with a rag, redone with a brush, scraped off, put back. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the you know, the depth and, and cars. I mean, I, I know, I can't tell you how many times in photography I've had to retouch out cars or, you know, actually get somebody to move a car because it was intruding. And I just thought, I, I just want to sort of I don't want to honor them, but I wanted to recognize them and say, you know, they can be subjects of paintings and they can add, they can add um, interest. And so um, that was one of my goals here. And I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with that whole left, left lower side where there's just strong, bold marks and um, such. And uh, utility lines, again, something we often think of as 
you know, detracting from the landscape, but they can, to me, they can really add strength to a composition. Um, next slide. Um, one of the things from that first painting I showed that um, I realized is I, you know, when I frame up these photos or see them and then think about the edges is how, you know, everything is a shape. Um, often it's in our classes and are the artists, it's like you're not painting something, you're painting the shapes. And here I was so uh, I'm just enamored of that blue thing up in the top, which is a sky, but that little arrow that's that's between the buildings, and then those notches that kind of wander around all the corners of the painting and the center, and then real darks where there's um, there's still shapes within darks, but then that the other layer is texture and variation within that. And um, you know some hard, strong, clean edges, and then some looser things, and then you know orange, one of my favorite colors, and a brilliant uh, that juxtaposition of orange and blue. I don't know. I figure like, try it, see, you know, go for it. Thank you. Uh, next one. Um, this is probably the most recent painting. Uh, it's about 18 by 24 and it's looser someplace I wanna move a little bit toward and it's fast. And um, this is where I really wanna give credit to Sam Green because this was done in his class. And I don't know if there's some prohibition against showing this in a show, but you know, he, he, uh, we, this was done in about two hours or maybe an hour and three quarters and then 15 or 20 minutes of a little touch up after some drying. And um, the speed is just so helpful to, 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 to refrain from over, over detailing and over painting and overworking and to stay with one's uh, first grasp of something and the strength of something. So um, um, I don't know, this is where I'm moving, I hope to go, but we'll wander around like all painters do. And I think the next one is the uh, last one. Yes, and away from the city for a minute, uh, I was, you know, realizing that, okay, I'd been finding a way to make marks and a way to use lines and a way to work with tools. And I thought I'd try them on some landscape. And this was a little snapshot from a hike up in New Hampshire around a marsh uh, with some late sun. And um, I was pretty happy with the way the mixture of smooth places and thin places and thick places. And, um, you know, uh, it, it, what I like is that it, it, it really looks like paint applied places. And then, you know, it, you realize it is a place. I mean, the tree line maybe is a little too literal, but I've got work to do. And just like all painters, the next one, we hope the next one will be better. And, uh, I'm looking forward to all of them ahead. So thank you. And, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Warren, that was great. Um, let's see. So I do have a question in the chat, which is what is the thought process you go through to decide the size of the canvas you choose for each subject? Um, I, 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 I'm really, um, I really have settled on, you know, unless I'm doing, um, well, I know they all vary. They're all somewhere around like between eight, 20, 20 inches square, 18 by 24, going up to maybe 24 by 30. I just have, found, even though I'll paint smaller things, 
Um, and certainly if I were to go outside and paint plein air, which I look forward to doing more of, I would, I would paint a little smaller. But um, there's something about the way I think one perceives a painting when you're a certain distance away from it. And um, I'm really drawn to something that is, um, you know, when you can stand about six feet away and still apprehend the effect of it in a, in a, in a, in a more simple way, and then you can still get up close to it and find texture and detail and surface. But when you back up or even, um, I think Judy wrote me a really nice email today and she said, even from across the room, some of them look nice. So, um, you know, I thought I liked that idea of seeing something from far away and uh, or seeing a painting from six or eight feet away and it still holds your attention. It's funny that you mentioned Judy, because the next question is from Judy Vilmain, who said, uh, Warren, do you decide in advance what areas will be thin paint and what areas will be thick paint? Um, in advance, uh, probably not. I think I've fallen into ruts sometimes where if I find something, some area that's uninteresting, I'll try to add a lot of thick paint. And then I realize well, that was the wrong thing to do. And then I'll scrape it off and try something else. And um, uh, I don't, I don't know if I, I, I think I, I'm getting a little better at doing that more naturally rather than planning it. But um, I don't have a good answer for that. <laughs> uh, let's see. And there's another question. Um... Let's see. So Sam says, "Congrats on painting. Uh, congrats on paintings. What I can only describe as the most beautiful Jersey barrier I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> after seeing this show and hearing you talk, I found myself wondering, uh, how does your painting today affect your photography? It's obviously still part of your practice, but do you find yourself taking photos to keep as photos, or are they only there now to serve your luscious paintings?" Um. You know, I've, I've just, this is where I can be very honest and frank is that I treat my photo, my photography has been, you know, a, a really fortunate career. And it's just, a, it's just this completely different kind of photography that I go and I'm working for a client and I'm trying to satisfy them and come up with something, you know, still bold and creative and still bold and yet creative and yet satisfy the depiction of a space and make it dramatic, but also make it explanatory. And then when I go out to take pictures for paintings, I almost want to make them less than explanatory. I want to make them uh, um, hard to understand or really disproportionate in certain areas. So, and I don't think I would ever, um, I would ever treat those as photos to keep their photos for paintings. So that's, um, I, you know, I, I've just, I was never good at being an art photographer. I went to RISD and, you know, a lot of people would, would just do these fantastically creative, moody, strange pictures. And I was always taking pictures of things, trying to make them look really good. And I just kept that, I've decided I'm good at that and I want to be good at painting, but I don't want to paint. I don't want to paint things as much as I want to make, just make paintings. So that's great. That was a great explanation. Um, so I have a couple questions for, um, for Mary. The first one is Ma uh, from Ann Cardi who said, Mary, how was the process of working from your imagination in the garden series different from the landscapes you did on location or from photos? took me a lot more prep work. I did a lot of studies for those paintings because um, I was inventing everything. Um, you might look at different landscapes or pieces or snips and clips, but really some of them I went in and worked out in um, uh, SketchUp first as a, as a you know, get, getting perspectives because I love space in my paintings. I'm not someone who paints flat pictures. I love to have depth. And um, 
as an architect, I think I'm always looking at molding space. So those those pictures um, are, you know, if you're painting what's in front of you, you can be interpreting it or moving it or cropping it, but you're not inventing it. Um, so, it, but it, it was more personal and I tried to bring more of myself and my family and into it. I'd like to start finding, I think the, the trees and conversation are the best combination of the two because they're the gesture gets very personal and exciting, but it, um, it'll be interesting to see where it goes next. Uh -huh. um, and another question for Mary is from Rochelle Russell, who said, Mary, the palette for Zion as compared to New England, sky, plants, stones are pretty different. Um, was that challenging for you? Yes, um, I have up hanging up in the Fleur de Lis about 12 to 14 Zion paintings trying to get it right um, <laughs> that didn't make it into the show because, um, but it's a really fun challenge. It's a really fun challenge to work on what's, what's the paint, what's the value, what's the, I just, you wanna keep, I keep wanting to be scared when I paint. Am I gonna be able to get this? I don't wanna be able to just, Oh yeah, I know how to do this. So, so having a different landscape to look at is really fun that way. Um, Excellent. Um, any other questions for the chat? If you want to, if anyone wants to put some in the chat, um, I'll ask another question of um, I'll ask another question of Warren, which is. Warren, when you, you talked a little bit about different sort of instruments that you use when you're painting, whether you're scraping and stuff, um, like what percentage of your paintings are you using implements that aren't brushes or, you know, what implements do you like to use the most to paint? Um, actually, the implement I like to use the most is a, uh, is a, uh, a big long putty knife or taping knife or some kind of a straight edge. Um, I just, I really like really hard lines. You know, of course they don't dot, they don't, they're not, everything isn't a hard line, but I just, I was always intrigued by edges, but not every edge is sharp, but I think my, my, my most, I don't know. I think it feels like when I'm, when I'm, drifting a little bit, I'll want to pull out some sharp edge and paint next to it. And then it'll everything like fuzzy around it will look better because there's something sharp there for it to play against. Um, other than that, yeah. Um, for a while, I was really heavily using some palette knives and I've gone and I had trouble with brushes. And then I found maybe stupidly that you know, those, uh, this is getting really in the weeds, but that uh, like natural bristle brushes look, work better with oil paint than the synthetic brushes. <laughs> and again, it's like all of a sudden it's like, oh, they're easier to work with. So maybe I'll try these for a while. And, um, and rags, I mean, I, I, I really like rubbing stuff, you know, painting it and then rubbing it off and and then it, it using your fingers and even sometimes I confess just the glove on my hand, um, you know, does does magic sometimes. And uh, OK, that's enough. Oh, that was great. Thank you. Um, I have another question for Warren from Ann Cardi, who said, um, I have heard from you uh, during class that you like Diebenkorn. Can you talk a little bit about his influence on your work? Oh, gosh, you know, I. Uh, there's paintings that I could, I think I could just see them. I can just see them. Like as soon as I conjure them up, I can see the whole painting. It feels like I can see every little bit of detail in them. I, I just saw some of his landscapes from California and they just don't leave my head. And so they, I keep going back to them. And he, and he was able to paint these big shadows and these buildings and they, and my eye would just go back and forth between seeing 
a landscape with buildings and shadows, and then just seeing these big fields and pieces of paint and shapes. And I was really captivated by him. And, and there was another painter I wanted to mention. I haven't mentioned it very much, but when I was like a high school student, I think we took a field trip to the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis where I grew up. And I saw a painting by Hans Hoffman, which is this abstract expressionist from the early 20th century, this German guy. And I think he had like two yellow rectangles that were perfectly, you know, I mean, they were kind of square edge things, just kind of slightly offset with some other blocks of color in the background. And I thought about, you know, how simple that was and that I couldn't take my eyes off it as a painting. And I guess it's just, you know, my life of, photography has been in rectangles mm -hmm. and but that one might have set me go set me on the course I don't know so he he did it but Diebenkorn you know then I'll go back to him and look through the book and his series of you know so he, he started out I think doing some well he's I don't know where exactly he started but there was a big phase of real abstract uh snaky looking paintings that were all Mush, mushed up and stuff. And then he went to these actual landscapes, which I think are really his finest stuff. And then he went back and combined, I think the, the lines and space of a landscape with big fields of color. And his the series is called Ocean Park and they're just breathtaking. But another thing somebody asked me about size like you look at you know, all these reproductions in the book of Diebenkorn and you see them on a full art book. And then you look in the fine print and it says it's about like six and a half feet by eight feet. And you think to experience that painting is more than just looking at it. You're like, you're in its environment when you're in front of it. And I've only gotten to see one and I long for the opportunity to see more of them in reality because I think they would they would be uh, like I say like being in an environment rather than looking at a painting. He also painted some figures, uh, and Sam in his classes, the, some of the wise and you know just incredibly smart exercises. He's often told us to pick out your favorite painting and bring it in and we're going to paint from it. And once we get it in there, he says, OK, now hold it up, get ready and now turn it upside down and now paint it. Mm -hmm. And so I'd pick a painting of Diebenkorn's, but because I have such trouble with figures, I would pick one that he did of a fig of a figure, but I paint it upside down and then I'd go look at it and turn it upright and I'd go something like I just painted a Richard Diebenkorn <laughs> and it was uh, <laughs> it was something I probably couldn't have done or wouldn't have done but it was a great exercise that's great um and a, a question for both of you from Susan Shaw is um both your respective works use color in interesting ways how does color temperature enter into your thought process when painting you can both answer that question Mary uh, I I it's something I'd still like to keep working on mastering, um, but I'm always conscious of the effect of reflected light into the shadows and how that often contrasts with the, with the temperature of the light around it. Um, but I think somewhat arbitrarily, I'll still keep my palette somewhat limited um, and hope that that also helps pull it, pull it together. I love the paintings where it looks fairly convincing that it's all in the same place, that the light temperature is consistent enough that you can imagine the day. But um, I think, Susan, that that's something I'd really like to keep studying and experimenting with. I'm not satisfied yet. Um, I I use a very limited palette. It's something I would must give credit to one of the other fine painters that I was uh, lucky enough to to paint with. That was Dora Milliken, and I still 
I still find the limitation of one red, one yellow, one blue, and a white to be a limitation that's that sort of frees me to not think about like which color am I going to use for this. So I'll just pretty much stick with that. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I may stray from that, but for the time being, I'm still working on shape and texture and surface and composition and and the quality of strokes. I do, I do really. Um, I really enjoy, uh, or I really believe that, you know, shadows, especially outdoors, you know, your, your shadows are almost always bluish. And um, I'm not sure how one would handle if you'd said, no, I'm going to try to make a really warm shadow. I mean, it can have warms in it, but I think it, it doesn't. And so, you know, natural light can look that. I haven't painted much in overcast conditions, which is something I should try because it might change my opinion of that. But uh, um, I don't know. I don't know if that was a good answer. I had an interesting experience yesterday because I went in to see one of a kitchen being installed in a house I was doing the faces directly down on the bay and the kitchens towards the back the cabinets looked like light turquoise. And it was because all the reflected light bouncing off the water, all the skylight was, even though they were very warm white, it was like someone shining a blue flashlight on them. And I'm like, oh my God, but the color was right. It was just the intensity of the blue light <laughs> shining into that kitchen was just, you just couldn't work around it. It was startling how much light there is, how much color there is in the light that you're not always aware of. But I think for me, I love painting because when I walk away from a painting session, my eyes are, are so activated. Everything looks hyper um, interesting and excited because it turns on your eyes to see more. It's, it's a great process. Um, I, you can you you gain so much from trying to paint um so so I'll, i'm gonna keep at it <laughs> <laughs> um does anyone else have any questions you'd like to put in the chat as we're we're sort of getting close to seven so if anyone wants to ask a last question or two um and if so i'll give you one second to think about that and then i will say first of all thank you to both mary and warren for sharing your images and for talking to us about some of the pieces in your show is very fun uh, excellent work to both of you. Uh, I know it's hard to talk about your art in addition to making the art. Um, and all of you received a copy of the, we have a virtual catalog that goes with the show. So you can see every piece in the show virtually. Um, if you're on Instagram and Facebook, if you go to the story section on our Instagram, you can watch a virtual tour of the show and you can see everything in the space. Um, so you can do that as well. And like I said, if you want to schedule a time to come and see the show outside of the regular hours, which are weekdays from 12 to four, you can do that. The galleries at the club are very large. We have very big galleries. And so you're not really going to be near anyone when you visit. So they are, we feel like they're very safe places to be right now. Um, and then the other thing I'll say is that if you enjoyed this talk, you can join us for our next one, which is going to be Lucia Delaris, who also has a show on right now. And Lucia is going to be talking about her show next Wednesday evening. Uh, that's February 24th. And the information for that one is also on Eventbrite and on our website. So you can register for that one there. Um, so does if anyone else doesn't have a question, I will ask the last question. Any other questions? OK, so the last question I always ask is um, both to Warren and to Mary, what's the, la what's the next thing you're going to be working on? I, I, I want to keep going with the Scotland paintings. Um, but the other thing is that I think I usually have a midwinter interlude of still life painting um, when it's mud season. Um, so I can see some still lifes coming up and I'm starting to think about, once I'm vaccinated, I hope to be traveling again. <laughs> <laughs> and for you, Warren? Um, I'm gonna be really honest and say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, that's a good answer. <laughs> 
Excellent. Well, I thank you all for being here with us tonight. We did videotape it. So if you missed anything or had to step away, you can let me know and, um, and I'll talk to Mary and Warren about posting the video of this. Um, but thank you to Mary and Warren and please come see their show in person. It's excellent. Good job. <laughs> thank you everybody for coming. It's great. I really appreciate yep. it. I wish Thanks we could so all uh, be mingling and clinking glasses sometime to come. Thank you. Oh, please. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Great job to the both of you. Thanks everyone and have a great night. Thanks so much. Bye, thank you.